So I'm joined by four distinguished warriors of words. Men who wade through the many mirages of history, seeing through facts and fiction, and seeing through the unsaid and the usurped, the lived in and the left out, and transcending several barriers of space and time. So I'm hoping today we'll have a brief and a frank conversation about what it takes to live with the archives, with the records, with the historical accounts, with the many mirages and sometimes false memories that history throws at us, and how, to, how do we get to reconstructing sometimes, deconstructing, re-examining, retelling, and sometimes taking a hermeneutical approach to reinterpreting history for uh, a civilizational uh, consumption. So, well, it comes as no surprise then that the art of biography or the biographic process is as varied and diverse as the object and the objective of the biographer's muse. And so I'm going to use a round robin approach. I'm going to invite these authors to talk about their biographic style, their method, if they have evolved a unique way to triangulate the various vignettes, trivia, records, and historical uh, information that led to their tomes. So I'll lead with you, Manu. Actually, Go ahead. So well, uh, my first book was a biography of a woman who had been in power in Kerala in the 1920s. And I think the initial challenge was that this was somebody who'd somebody who been obscured out, somebody who'd been footnoted a great deal, not necessarily spoken of as a serious figure in history, somebody who was there as a flash in the pan and then disappeared quickly. Uh, as a person, she had chosen a certain kind of obscurity. She left no private papers. She left official documents, her official letters and papers, but nothing providing any kind of, of a window into how she thought, you know, who she was as a person, what were her tastes, what were her interests. Already I thought, you know, the fact that this was a person who had died many decades before, many years before I was born, that alone created a gap. But there were people who knew her, there were family members, there were descendants, there were nurses, you could go all around and find, you know, various people who had known her. And then this whole business of false memories uh, came in, which is that there's a way sometimes people remember the past and then there's the way the past actually unfolded. And especially with, you know, famous people, people who had been in influence, people who had been uh, positions of political power, there's a tendency where there's, there's a series of things that encrust around them, sometimes off-tune with the actual dates, sometimes with a new gloss because political winds had changed and therefore the same event would be read in a completely different way. Now, for example, there was the Maharaja of Travancore, Chitra Tirunal, who was famous for his temple entry proclamation. And uh, that was the, the, it, it was a result of a long sustained movement by the Irva community demanding temple access, something that had happened over several decades. And what's interesting is that he, of course, uh, bowed to the pressure, did what he needed to do, and threw open the temples. But it's interesting that over a period of time, a number of stories sort of came around this. One of them said that Sri Narayana Guru himself, who was the leader of the Iravas, had prophesied that this prince would be born who would save the Iravas and, you know, sort of do wonderful things for them. Which is a way also of eclipsing a whole political process that had lasted many decades and sort of subsuming it into a story. The story has value. It's a way, it's a way in which people also reconcile and get over past conflict. If there was conflict between various communities in the past, the story helps you sort of transcend that and move on and create a new future. But it's interesting, I thought that, you know, it was my job to be able to tell one apart from the other. Uh, the sources, of course, you have to read them critically. Uh, in my case, there was material the British uh, kept in their intelligence report. Some of it was explosive, as, as we say now. Uh, some of it was sensitive. Not all of it went into the book, because what crossed certain lines had to stay out. But anything that was private, but also politically relevant, went in. So you have to make choices like that when working on, on, on themes of this nature. It's also about where you find your sources. So you, you have an official report sent about your subject by, say, the British resident or the Viceroy, and that gives you the official picture. Now, in the same archives, it turns out this particular resident had left his private letters to his mother, which gave you a completely different picture, more gossip, more color, more everyday information that didn't make it to the official records. So it's the job of the biographers also to uncover as much as possible and try and unearth this, put it together, and then 
make an effort to comprehend the person. I don't think I can ever claim I've fully comprehended the person. I don't think I can claim I've ever, I've fully penetrated her mind or understood what she was thinking. What I have perhaps done is, with the material available, I have tried my best to reconstruct the person, their times, their motivations, their incentives, the good and the bad. And I think, you know, that's a challenging process in a certain way. In some, uh, there, are, there are times of frustration when you're almost, uh, you want to shake the project off and say, you know, why am I so consumed by this person? Why am I so consumed by this story? But such is, I think all biographers perhaps face that challenge. Yes, indeed, it's a maze of sometimes over-documented falsities and under-affirmed truths. And the biographer's predicament is to actually place himself in that sweet spot. And of course, there's always the danger of the biographer's bias and his own blind spots shining brighter than the subject on which he actually intends to write about. So, um, Hindol. Your book unravels the phenomenon behind a man. Well, which of my books? Uh, and um, I I'll mean, if you can start off with your most current yeah, book, Sing, I'll, Pray, uh, and Dance. I'll take and your broader point, which is a very interesting point. Uh, <laughs> how does a biographer approach subjects, and why do we write about these people? And since you want me to begin with uh, my latest book, yeah, Srila Prabhupada. Um, Srila Prabhupada was an intriguing figure in my childhood because... Uh, I first lived, the first house I ever live, rem remember living in had an ISKCON temple next door. So, you know, one of my very early, vague, hazy memories are of, of these monks sort of singing and dancing with symbols. But then for many years, I didn't really engage with the ISKCON universe, so to speak. Until actually I began thinking about Srila Prabhupada again when I wrote my book on Vivekananda. And that actually was interesting to me because I'm in many ways, you know, I'm a child of a Ramakrishna Mission family. You know, my parents are part of Ramakrishna Mission, my grandparents were part of Ramakrishna Mission, and so on and so forth. So, and so much had been written about Vivekananda. Uh, it was interesting to me to try and figure out what I could say that would be new and engaging about Vivekananda. And then, to me at least, it was the fact that he's a quintessential modern figure. Now, this modern word is very complicated and it sort of evokes different reactions depending on the audience. But, but I you know, still took up that challenge to write about Vivekananda as somebody who exemplified a certain kind of modernity. And at that time, we began thinking about Srila Prabhupada because if you think about it, uh, in terms of global Hinduism or Hinduism taken around the world, the person who had the largest footprint around the world after Vivekananda was Srila Prabhupada. And, and, uh, but Srila Prabhupada's story is very different. You know, Vivekananda goes to America as a very young man. Srila Prabhupada only lands up in America at the age of 70. Um, he's virtually penniless. Vivekananda also didn't have much money, but he still had the support of the Maharaja of Khetri. And the people who introduced Vivekananda to the, to the society of America, so to speak, including the man who writes the letter that introduces him to the Parliament of Religion, was a Harvard professor. Whereas Srila Prabhupada goes and engages, you know, with the hippies of New York. And it was very intriguing to me that this man who had never traveled abroad at the age of 70, surviving heart attacks, goes in this ship, uh, in this cargo ship, lands up in America, lives only for 10 years after, uh, after he lands up in America, and manages to build temples in 100 sites around the world, builds a global movement, gets Allen Ginsberg to, you know, as a follower, uh, George Harrison to sing Hare Krishna, Hare Rama, and, and he had, a, he had an amazing life, you know? I mean, how did the 70-year-old man suddenly land up there and do these things? You know, he had no access to that society. He didn't know anyone there. And yet he managed. And through the course of my book, the Prabhupada book, I discovered, you know, and you, you're talking about different sources. I discovered a YouTube video of a recording. You know, there's this great series of video recordings between uh, Allen Ginsberg and William Buckley Jr at the height of the anti-Vietnam War protests in America. This is essentially the leading lights, the young leading lights of the, or younger leading lights of the right and the left debating one another night after night on TV, right? And in one of those videos, so <laughs> Allen Ginsberg gets frustrated by something that William Buckley Jr. is asking about the Vietnam War, and he says, I don't think you'll get it. Let me try and explain to you in another way and pulls out a mini harmonium from under the chair 
and begins to sing Hari Rama, Hari Krishna. And the, and the reaction of William Buckley Jr. in that video is priceless. This man has no clue what's happening, right? And, and to think that this 70-year-old man who lived with, you know, the hippies and the drug addicts of, uh, of New York managed to do this and managed to have this impact was incredible to me. So I approached it uh, from that point of view and trying to understand how we can place a man like this in a global context. You see, what happens with especially people who are connected to religion is that one tends to look at them from one or two dimensions, from the viewpoint of the believer, so to speak, right? And only the viewpoint of the believer. What happens because of that is you miss out all the context. These men don't or these women don't exist in a you know, vacuum, of course. They're a product as much of their time, right? I mean, I, for instance, have said in many, uh, on many platforms that actually Srila Prabhupada, of course, had a very powerful message and he had a powerful manner of placing that message. But it also fell to a particularly ripe audience. It was an audience that was at, the, at that time trying to reject what to, we would today call the military industrial complex, so to speak, uh, of America, wanted a different message. And the hippies, one wouldn't think of this, was a particularly potent bunch of people. You know, and they were his first, you know, they were his first shishyas. And what is he teaching them? And that's the other interesting thing in, in, uh, you know, that I discovered through the writing of this book. He's not only teaching them, okay, you worship Krishna and you sing the kirtan like this and so on and so forth. He's teaching them how to keep vegetarian food and non-vegetarian food separately. That you must wash your hand before eating. That if you cannot, you know, if you, uh, the ideal spiritual way is chastity, but if you cannot manage that, if you must, you only have and be faithful to one sexual partner, right? Imagine, I mean, you know, think about this, this 70-year-old man who had never been anywhere, lands up among the hippies and is telling them, please be faithful to your partner. So it's an incredible story. As a story, it was very, very important and very interesting. And, and you know, I tried to put it in a global context, which is what I've tried to do in all of my work, including Patel. Uh, now, Patel is a whole new story because, you know, Patel is connected to India's immediate political debates and so on and so forth. But Patel, again, before, uh, you know, after Rajmohan Gandhi wrote a wonderful book about him, for three decades, nothing had been done on Patel, right? And Patel, again, was a very interesting character to me. Again, somebody who refused to write, you know, Patel, one of the interesting things about Patel is between Gandhi, Nehru, and Patel, Patel is the only one who really never wrote his version of the story. The other two, of course, did, and quite uh, voluminously. So there was, a, there was an interesting, um, you know, uh, need to re-look at Patel uh, and try and understand what he means to our contemporary moment. So, which was my attempt in the Patel book. Fantastic. Yep, it's actually a very fascinating study of why we choose to write about whom and when and what that tells us about our own selves in many ways. So, we'll, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about... Uh, what it took, or how, how the journey moved from your book on Sardar Patel and, and how it sort of uh, evolved into the writing of the uh, tome on uh, Prabhupada. So we'll get back to you on that. Gautam Ji, your book is, if, I'm, uh, if I may say, it's, it's the reading of Aurobindo, but I would say it, it's a hermeneutical approach and the larger motivations, I suppose, in, in writing that book is to provide access to something that has been poorly understood to a larger demographic. And, yeah. uh, and so in that process, please, uh, please elaborate on that process and then how did you get to reading Aurobindo the way you did? <laughs> yeah. Uh, in fact, the process is the story. Uh, it was his uh, 150th birth anniversary that coincided with India's 75th Independence Day on 15th August 2022. And a little, uh, year, one year before that, I thought that, you know, hardly any people know about Sri Aurobindo. Those who know, don't know enough. For instance, he has written 36 volumes, the, the physical size of which is from the end of that chair to here. That's, that's the amount of volumes of work that Sri Aurobindo has done. Uh, 36 volumes, 21,000 pages, 6 million words uh, in his all, entire life. And me, uh, 
in, in Delhi, there is a road called Sri Aurobindo Marg. I hadn't heard of Sri Aurobindo, and I would be on Sri Aurobindo Marg every day, and I didn't know who Sri Aurobindo was. Uh, perhaps I wasn't paying attention in school, but I think the fact is he wasn't present in my books in school. He was cancelled. Uh, and, th and I feel that even today, with the kind of depth, the kind of width, the heights that Sri Aurobindo has written or explored Indian spiritual traditions, taken them to the next level, he remains, if not cancelled, at least subdued. And we thought that perhaps the 150th birth anniversary would be a good time to rejuvenate these ideas. Why is Sri Aurobindo important? He's a political figure. He's written on history, culture, philosophy, poetry, dramas, and above all, Savitri, his phenomenal work. And all of his works, even when he was a freedom fighter, even when he was in jail, the Uttar Para speech uh, explains how and what was happening. So I thought this was a time to get into Sri Aurobindo. And the story is this, that I thought I'll read all the 36 volumes. I have been reading them. So I, I mean, I, I have a working knowledge of all the volumes uh, for over 20 years. So I thought I'll put it all together. Uh, everybody would ask me, which book of Sri Aurobindo should I read? And I wouldn't have any answer, because if it's a poet, I would tell him Savitri. If, if, if it's a political person, I would say Bande Mataram. If it is a philosopher, I would say The Life Divine, and so on. I, I didn't know, uh, I couldn't say which book you should read. So I thought, let me familiarize everybody with the 36 volumes. As I began that work, I realized it's beyond me. Because reading Sri Aurobindo, there is a physical challenge, which is easy to uh, do, but there is also an intellectual challenge. The grammar of his writing, the ideas that he talks about are very difficult. So I contacted my co-editor, um, Devdeep Ganguly. I said, let's do this together. And he also gave up. Even the two of us couldn't do it. We then got all told 21 writers, each of whom has spent one, two, or maybe even three decades working on a particular book or deciphering a particular stream of thought. That's how this book came. In the process, so I'm not a biographer per se, but um, I think it's like a surgical strike of, of a policy writer uh, into biography. And the same thing happened with my Arvind Kejriwal book. Uh, in 2014, he, he was a phenomena in Delhi. Things were happening. He was winning. I thought, let me uh, do a, just figure out what's happening. So it's not again, although the name is the disruptor and Arvind Kejriwal, but it's actually an, it's an investigation or a, or a study of um, political entrepreneurship uh, of that time. And where uh, I have spoken about Arvind Kejriwal, Narendra Modi, and Rahul Gandhi. And I, what I realized when I step back through these intrusions uh, that I have done, or my reform nation, which has also come, where I intruded into uh, Indira Gandhi, all the prime ministers who um, brought out reforms from uh, 1991 till uh, 2022, the, the, the 30 years of reforms. I found that in order to really write about a person uh, in, in a biographical way, uh, you have to become the person. And I think that kind of thing is not possible if you only approach the person through secondary sources, through his intellectual writings, a speech or two. Uh, it, it cannot happen through journalism. Uh, because uh, you interview what is he telling you and how you are uh, using that information or collating it in your mind, contextualizing it, is very different. He would do it differently, I would do it differently. So you don't get the truth. And, I, and the only way that, that I now feel, after having done the Sri Aurobindo book, is to become your subject. Uh, or at least the ideas that you're subject to. It's a difficult idea in the sense, it's, it, it's almost like a spiritual thing that you identify so much that you become it and then you get out of it and write about it as an observer. So uh, technically, again, I, I repeat, I'm not a biographer, but I've done enough biographies in the process of my uh, other writings. Would you say you, I know you are the vice president of The Observer, so would you say you have been an observer or have you been somebody, and for having spent two decades in the academia, how is reading Aurobindo different from an edited volume in the, in the academic parlance? And often I've seen that edited volumes, when you have more than 10 authors, have multiple analytical orientations, 
and multiple attitudes to viewing the same knowledge or a body of knowledge. So how so did you in, build in, consensus? In this case, we gave a very simple brief to every author that we are not interested in your mind, your knowledge, what you know. We are interested in your reading of Sri Aurobindo. Hence, it's called reading Sri Aurobindo. It's not called analyzing Sri Aurobindo. It is not a biography. Uh, so when you read, let us say, uh, essays, divine and human, uh, what is your reading? What do you get from it? How do you familiarize a person who doesn't know? So the idea of this book, Reading Sri Aurobindo, is that if you cannot read those 36 volumes, and I assure you they're very difficult to read, and God help you if you pick up the life divine, uh, you will never read Sri Aurobindo ever again, but uh, if that's your first book. But it, it is like a familiarization. So we look at this book as a bridge on which a person can walk and reach the original uh, sources of uh, his original writings. Thank you. Akshayaji, your journey from Gita Press to your showcasing the many lives of a single man, writer, rebel, soldier, lover. How has your own uh, biographical style emerged through these two books? Has it or not? Please elucidate. Thank you. Uh, this biography is of Hindi writer because many of her uh, people here might not have heard of him. He was one of the tallest Hindi writers after Prem Chand. The name Agge was given to him by Prem Chand. His real name was Sachidanand Hiranand Vatsayan and then Agge got ag added, which he never liked. Uh, Agge is also one of the mostly, most written Hindi writers of all times. By the time I started his biography, there are many biographies in Hindi, one authorized biography, but you know, you find bits of his life everywhere. And every book has only added to the mystery of Agge. And he was, as it is, he, he kind of stood out from his generation of Hindi writers and subsequent generation of Hindi writers for the kind of life he led, for the kind of background he came from. He was not your quintessential Hindi writer who came from small town in the Hindi heartland. He grew up all over India, including in Chennai, where he went to Madras Christian College, then went to Foreman Christian College in Lahore, became a revolutionary with Chansekhar Raja and others, spent four years in jail. So when I got on to do his biography, I was lucky to have access to uh, 20 trunks of his private papers. Uh, these 20 trunks were kind of through new facets. It, it told you how so much myth has been created about Agge over the years. He was a very different man. But still, these 20 trunks were not enough to fill major gaps about Agge because you know there are two, three myths about Agge. One, that... Uh, you know, whether he was revolutionary enough or not. Uh, that took me to archives in Delhi, two archives which had almost 1,500 pages of his revolutionary years. The time he was spending uh, this commission of inquiry, everything was there. Then another myth about Agge is that he was a British agent because he, uh, how come a revolutionary of the 1930s became joint British Army in 1940 and worked in Ceylon? Uh, that again, you find there's enough record and one of the uh, British historian who joined, uh, worked with him uh, during that period in uh, Ceylon, wrote a fascinating account of that period. But uh, the larger accusation against him was of being a CIA agent, uh, which was 1950 when CIA set up Congress for Cultural Freedom. And one of the la biggest meetings were held in, was held first, was to be held in Delhi, but last minute it got cancelled and it was held in Bombay. And Agge was the kind of the prime mover of that meeting. And you find those papers. And it's in Hindi world, you will hear everyone say that, you know, he was a CIA agent. Fair enough. But you find those papers lying in archives spread across uh, Chicago, Stanford, Sleepy Hollow, New York. And so that me some good time to kind of figure them out, access them, and then you find there is a completely new Agge. What, through the biography, what I have tried to do is a kind of the humanness of Agge, the larger than life image of Agge. So there are many people who have been telling me, oh, why do you have to write this? Uh, he, had, he had a fascinating love life, you know, his first wife becomes Balraj Sani, second wife, there's a complete chaos in his love life. You find even that uh, 
part of his private papers, including a secret lover on whom the entire fashion novel, which is everyone who can read in Hindi should read, called Nadi Ke Dweep, which is actually a love story in the backdrop of Second World War, uh, which is about this lady, Kirpa Sain, who nobody knew about. So that he papers gave me access. And it also shows that, uh, I guess, how extractive he was when it came to women. So as a biographer, see, if I like a gap, if I'm giving five years of my life on a subject, on a person, I have to like him, his writings. He was, he was the tallest Hindi writer. He introduced modernism in Hindi literature. Sekhar Ek Jibni, even after more than 70 years, continues to sell uh, in large, large numbers. He modernized Hindi poetry called New Poetry, it started with Tar Saptak, Dusra Saptak, which is septet, seven poets he'll get, and who were writing poetry uh, different from what the generation of Hindi write poets like uh, Maithili Saran Gupta and others were doing. So he's also revolutionizing literature, his own life. So he was an ideal subject. But the thing is that you have to maintain that distance. Much as I like him, you can't brush things under the carpet. And there's this constant battle which happens between uh, the biographer and the subject about the revealed self and the concealed self or the public life and the private space. So, uh, but, uh, so I try to rely as much as I can on mostly, in fact, on documents, on proper archival material, a letter, diary, correspondence, you know, all, all kinds of things. Uh, I'm, I interviewed around 60 people, you know, this is what something Manu was talking about, how memory comes to you, and I interviewed 60 people, and eventually I used only two interviews in the book, one of 93-year-old lady Krishna Sopti, great Hindi writer, whose memory never failed, and she was not trying to fix Agya after his death. Many of those people were trying to fix him through, you know, giving kind of, you know, narration of event or incident, which was so very different from what existed. So in the end, it became a fat book, but yeah, it's, a, it's, it's kind of a life of a gay. He becomes very human. You can see him in his good uh, light. You can see him if you, if you think, uh, you know, things which should not have been written. It's not a hagiography. It's completely... It, it places him uh, when it comes to writing, uh, gives him the due where it is uh, due. Otherwise, in his private space, whatever he's been doing, so everything is out there. Because some of them are very kind of sensitive, sensational. For instance, his own relationship with his first cousin. Uh, you don't write it till uh, you have enough evidence. And his papers, his private papers, through enough evidence, and which was huge point of scandal within the family. So I try to make that distance, try to put a gay in all his lights, all his sets. Therefore, uh, the book is also called Writer, Rebel, Soldier, Lover, because he, he did all these four things and much more. So this was my process of distancing myself, going through archives, spending time wherever it took me, and time and money to join the dots. And that's this, what I did. That's what Excellent. Kind of, this sort of nicely segues into the... We have about 10 minutes left of the session. And before opening the floor, I was hoping that I'll have a very kind volunteer from our distinguished authors here. Who uh, Biography is sometimes a tightrope walk. It's balancing the perception game, right? The perception of others, witnesses, records, the perception of the major stakeholders, the major contexts and the major vested interests that operate in that space and time, and also perhaps the perception of the author himself or the biographer himself. So if any of you would like to share an instance in the process of writing the, uh, the books that you've written where you actually had to consciously get out of the way or fully step in, correct, corroborate, and act on those missing voids of you don't have to get out of the way, you can corroborate, or if you can't corroborate, then yeah, you can just leave it at that. But yeah, don't make, uh, don't fall to the bazaar gossip, don't, don't write which, you know, can be easily contradicted. Right. Yeah, so my thing is why get out of the way? I'm, I'm not, a, it's not a hagiography. If someone has done something and if there's enough evidence, just write it 
and it doesn't take away the greatness of agge or anyone any right. any subject Absolutely. you know Absolutely. and you don't go into any subject with preconceived notion that this is what i have to do because material throws up new things something which you never imagine it it happens with uh, biographies right. all the time you thought that this man is only this much and you realize his private papers are telling you something else well yeah. it's true that we would want to believe that every biographer does come with his own perceptions and uh, so as much as possible uh, i just I want to come in yeah. on that word called balance uh, you know i don't do balance writing at all uh, i don't care I love that. Uh, I, I, I don't uh, say on the one hand, uh, even though I'm an economist, I don't do uh, on the one hand and on the other and on the third and the fifth. For me, writing my truth is all that is important. I read all the other hands, but I speak my own truth. I don't care to balance. That's actually a, a, a very different radical approach to biography. So, Manu, is there something you wanted well, to say? Well, it's just that, you know, when you're not sitting in moral judgment over your subject. Exactly. you are exploring and investigating your subject in their context in their time there will be things that surprise you as a creature of this time there will be things that are pretty normal like in today's world writing about somebody in the 1920s having a colorful sex life not so surprising lots of people have colorful sex lives Absolutely. why is it such a big deal not sitting in judgment if that happened great if it didn't happen great makes no difference again we're only placing these characters especially historical figures in context trying to understand them as best as we can and i think also admitting that as i said earlier perhaps we've got 95% of the picture not necessarily the full 100% because we weren't actually there so we are piecing together what we can from what is available but we can't necessarily always claim that this is the only way to tell this story Absolutely. because you know that 5% gap is there in terms of what um, akshay was saying earlier about uh, and you also brought up about evidence and material sometimes it's the gaps that are interesting also so you find a, a rich life with lots of data lots of information and suddenly at certain specific moments there are gaps and then you discover why are they just ask the question why are there these gaps you just need to point that out you don't need to fill the gap unless you have other corroborating evidence you need to go trying to somehow you know make sense of it but even asking the question or saying that look this much we have there are certain gaps here and it's interesting that these gaps exist why do they exist that leads you to interesting answers right. there's a famous painter amrita shergil and i think in a biography uh, written by uh, yashoda dalmia she she talks about how uh shergil was very upset when her mother destroyed nehru's letters to shergil and now that it's, it's an interesting question right like the man who would become india's first prime minister writing to this artist who is a very bohemian interesting figure and there's something about those letters that needed to be destroyed it poses an interesting question right. it, the question itself is in its way an answer also right well, like in music those silence i just want to yeah, make absolutely. one Go small ahead. point you know one of the things to understand about india is how little work has been done not how much if you look at you know two other countries where a lot of this kind of work happens both america and england major figures and major instances even minor instances in the history of that of those countries have been analyzed so many times through so many lenses angles and are continuously being rewritten in india we had this and perhaps still have this idea uh depending on who has the microphone so to speak in society that one truth must prevail this is a fundamentally problematic idea in every society but certainly in a society as large and complex and diverse as ours right i think our major figures and minor figures our major historical events and minor historical events required enormous amount of work from all kinds of lenses right we haven't even scratched the surface of understanding either these people or the historical instances but we tend to get a bit fixated as people saying well this is the final word and that comes from you know indian society is fundamentally feudal there's an inherent feudalism even in our approach to literature so there is a feudalism that oh you know this person said this about this time or this history or this person therefore it must be the truth that's rubbish that's ridiculous rubbish every generation and why gen every generation every new phase in a country's history has the right to tell stories from their own angles from their own lenses right i mean today for instance we are uh, looking at so much history from a gender lens which we never did before right 
So all of these things are absolutely valid. And the fact that they should coexist and jostle and you know, maybe even quarrel with one another is, the, is, a, is a democratic truth. Somehow we don't seem to understand that. We seem to think of this as unnecessary friction. It isn't. In my opinion, this is the, this is the living experience, this is the lived experience, so to speak, as they would say in academia, of democracy. And we should encourage this kind of jostling. Absolutely. So it's an ode to the happy coexistence and the beautiful coexistence of perhaps many truths, many retellings, and many re-examinations, and many re-elucidations, if you will. So I would leave the floor open for just about four minutes. Any questions, interactions with our authors? So as biographers, I know that you sort of check your biases before you start like researching your material or as such. But is there a fear that um, through your books, you inadvertently you know, start creating um, perspectives that might become popular through your book and amongst your readers versus, I mean, basically sort of influencing them to sort of, um, towards a certain uh, personality that you've sort of written about versus just broadening their horizons or, you know, of their train of thought or something like that. Is that, um, is that, that sort of fear amongst you when you write? I think Hindol sort of answered that, which is that it's not an either or question. You know, I've written about a subject in one way based on the material I could access from my perch from where I'm seated. Somebody else viewing the same historical figure from a different lens may write something else. We might even, as he was saying earlier, end up arguing about it and there might be a big quarrel about it. But that quarrel itself clarifies the process for future. Uh, take any historical figure. In Kerala, there's a king called Martandavarma. There's the official Darbar narrative in, in Sanskrit. But then there's also the Villipata or the local songs that uh, marginalized communities sang about him. Both give very different versions of the same man and both are equally valid sources in reconstructing his story and his biography. It's not an either or, and it's a bit like that. All, every new biography adds something. Even if it's a bad biography, I think, you know, it, it probably ends up uh, serving the larger point. No, no, so I actually would deeply like to challenge the idea that authors must do this or that for their readers. It is not the job of the author to expand the horizon of the reader. It is the job of the author, in my humble opinion, to present their perspective, which is a perspective, which can never be the perspective. It is a perspective. And it is the job of every reader to read multiple perspectives. Going back to my earlier point, which is why multiple you know, ways of looking at the same thing must coexist, to read all of that or experience all of that and come to their own truth, which may be very different from the truth that any author may have tried to present, right? And uh, the expectation that any author has or sh may have that, you know, we are going to convert any reader into f thinking like us is fundamentally a wrong expectation. I don't think we should expect that at all. Gautam ji, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, nothing uh, other than the fact that as and every writer is different. Uh, the way I write is that I just stare. Uh, like for instance, when I do some analysis, I just stare at the data for a long time and then I become the data and then I write from that. So uh, uh, for me, uh, a lot of <coughs> my writing is a lot of becoming the subject itself, which is the point I uh, made earlier. So uh, once I am the data, that's my truth. You are free to disagree. And by the way, he mentioned a, a good point. The reader will read, uh, and I don't know who articulated this beautiful line, that the writer only writes the book, then every reader reads it in his own way. So there are multiple books that happen after a writer has finished writing. Absolutely. So my question is, um, when you approach a subject, sometimes are you wary of picking up certain subjects that you might not politically identify with, or possibly you believe or perceive a particular subject to be just politically uncomfortable for you to write about? Uh, so most biographers probably have like an inspiration point to start off writing on a subject, but when you discover that maybe the subject is not politically kind of matching with your wavelength, do you go ahead writing it with the distanced approach or do you just abandon that idea? 
No, you don't abandon the idea, you continue. Imagine then there would have been no biography of Rasputin, you know. Someone was writing and so fascinating biography of Rasputin of Pol Pot. So you, you don't have to kind of politically always think whether the subject suits my political alignment or not. Uh, once you know the subject, it depends how, even if it's a hateful figure, how, uh, fasc how, how rich the life is and how best you can tell the story, best entirely on evidence. Ima imagine someone like Ayn Curso writing two volumes on, uh, which is one of the best biographies of Hitler. Uh, you know, Hubris and Nemesis, he writes. Which is, and, uh, which is entirely based on new material or someone who's just writing three volumes on Stalin. They did not be believers of all these gentlemen, but uh, you, you, you're interested in it, you're involved in it, and you think their story needs to be told based entirely as much on fact. And you don't prejudge, and you live, as everyone has been saying, you leave it to the readers to decide for themselves for what they make of the book. All right. Well, we'll leave you with the many, many, many dilemmas of the biographic muse. We have heard very diametrically opposite views. The view on becoming the subject, staring at the data, becoming the subject, and sensing the subject from a very primal, visceral uh, point of view. We've also heard views on distancing yourself from the subject and clinically looking at the data and creating a tome that sort of approaches the subject and the objective of the biography itself from a safe and comfortable distance. So ladies and gentlemen, here's the biographical <laughs> predicament, if you will. And we call it close. We call it close to this evening's proceedings. And over to you. Thank you so much once again. Dr. Deepti Navratna, let's give them a bigger round of applause. Akshay Mukul, Gautam Chikarmane, Dr. Hindol Sen Gupta, and Manu S. Pillay. Thank you so much for that very interesting session.